so hello. I'm going to get everybody a couple moments to get joined in. But for those who are tuning in, my name is Kate Craig, and I'm one of the candidates who's running to be the next chair of the Tennessee Democratic Party. Um, so like I said, and this is tonight, or tonight, today, we're going to be talking about rural and why having a rural strategy is important and why it's necessary to have a rural strategy um, for having it to have a 95 county strategy. You can't have one without the other. So like I said, before we dive in, fully dive into this, I'm going to give a couple seconds here to get, you know, let everybody get get tuned in um, and welcome. I hope everybody's having a good Sunday afternoon here across the state of Tennessee. I know today it's a little bit gloomy, but I'm I'm the person that looks forward to snow. So we're anticipating a snowy Christmas Eve with the family um, this Thursday. So I'm, I'm a little excited about that. Hopefully everybody's enjoying this weekend as we're going into the holiday season. So my name's Kate Craig. Um, for those that haven't met me yet um, or haven't seen me on social media, and uh, I'm one of the candidates who's running to be the next chair of the Tennessee Democratic Party. And I want to thank you for taking time out of your Sunday afternoon, um, away from family, away from as we're all doing holiday celebrations, to come and talk about why having a rural strategy is so important. And I want to start off by um, dispelling some notions about rural why I have a rural strategy, why I think it's um, critical, and what it means to have it. Um, but as as you're watching, please feel free to um, comment in the section in the comment section if you have some questions about rural uh, comments you want to add anything of that nature, and I'll I'll be looking for those to address those as well. Um, one of the things is I've been talking to people across the state is that there's this idea that as I've talked about having a rural strategy, it means that that's over or in place of having an urban or suburban strategy. And that's that's a, a common misconception. And so I want to clear it up, clear that up, that um, having a rural strategy is a yes and. Yes, have an urban strategy. Yes, have a, a suburban strategy. Yes, have a rural strategy. It's, it isn't an or. It is an and. And I want, you know, we have to absolutely have to target seeds. I don't, you know, there isn't this idea that having a rural strategy means that and I'm going to use Hancock County, I believe I used it in my last live stream, Hancock County, um, that we're going to focus on that, that county to flip it, a state house seat, that we know that we're just, we're going to push that one forward at the expense of district, uh, state house 97, or state house 82, or any of these other races um, that, of seats that we need to protect, or seats that came close, um, that, that also isn't the case. We, um, as somebody that's openly advocating for having a rural strategy, it's when we talk about Hancock County, it's making sure that Hancock County has a county party, has a county party that's identifying goals to take those next steps. It's that Hancock County has a county party that is recruiting candidates to run for school board, that Hancock County has a, uh, has a thriving county party that is out in the community and talking to voters. We talk about having a rural strategy. It isn't a cookie cutter, one size fit all, fits all for all counties, for all districts, for any of that, because one rural county isn't the same as the next rural county, the same as one urban county is not the same as another urban county or suburban county or any any such of the like. Um, so I want to just take a moment to dispel just some of those notions uh, as we start to talk about rural and why having rural is so important. And I also, uh, you know, as we're diving into this, I want to give a huge shout out to the TNDP Rural Caucus. This organization that launched this past summer has been doing absolutely amazing work. Ann Quillen, who's the chair of the, the caucus, is doing a great job with supporting candidates, with messaging, with reaching out to rural voters. And I think that it's done a tremendous job to raise awareness around what the needs are for rural communities. And I think that's, we don't, we as a party, as a Democratic Party, this is a national issue. We don't do a lot to talk about rural needs. It's, it's very easy to talk about suburban and urban needs. And um, I think that the party tends to get labeled as an urban party. And but that's not our roots. And it it's, again, goes back to the yes and. Um, it's not a 
either or situation, we have to also be talking to rural voters and we have to be supporting our rural candidates and we have to be supporting our rural county parties. Um, one thing that I wanted to talk about is right now there are three counties in uh, Tennessee that are blue. So that's Davidson County, um, Shelby County, and Haywood County. Those three counties went blue in 2020. So that's three out of our 95 counties. Um, and they're not, there's two urban and then one more rural county. Um, and then let's expand upon that. So, you know, some of you might have seen the graphic that I put out this week that there are six counties that are on the verge of turning blue. And I, you know, I'm going to define what, or how I define what turning blue means is that they got, uh, uh, Biden got more than 40% of the vote in those counties. And so those counties are Hamilton County, Knox County, Rutherford County, Montgomery County, Madison County, and Hardeman County. And I don't know if you're noticing like I am, those are, aren't all the same type of counties in terms of when we think urban, suburban, and rural. It's a mix of all of those, those types of classifications. And that's awesome that we have counties that are pushing and trending in that direction. So to have a fully effective 95 county strategy, um, to have a great way to target seats, to have a great way to turn out the vote and, and to push those counties into turning blue, we have to have a strategy that, that is a yes and, a strategy that is an urban, suburban, and rural focus. Um, so let me be real specific that I'm classifying um, Madison County and Hardeman County as rural counties of those six. Um, and I want to also relate Madison County is a lot like Washington County where I'm from. And so even though they're on opposite ends of the state, Jackson, Tennessee is about the same size as Johnson City. Jackson's about 67,000 in terms of population size. And Madison got 42.8% of the vote. Um, for Biden, excuse me, Biden got 42.8% of the vote in Madison County. Washington County got a little less. He got 31% of the vote. Um, but Washington County is trending blue in Northeast Tennessee and has been exponentially getting more, turning out more Democratic voters every um, election cycle, more than any of the other counties in Northeast Tennessee. So we have to be looking at where these, these trends are happening, um, which means that we can't write off our mid-sized towns. Um, and focus just on suburban and suburban just around our metropolitan areas. And so to further compare that, um, so we're, I'm going to use Washington County as the benchmark um, around this as to why we should be, you know, again, focusing on all of the counties and where they're going. And also the six counties, um, and they're about to trend blue, or they're about to flip and turn blue, that, so for example, in, in Nashville, the counties that um, surround and touch Davidson County. Um, so Wilson County got 29.9% of the vote. Biden got 29.9% of the vote in Wilson County. Same in Sumner County. Um, Cheatham County, 27.2. And Robertson County, 25.8. Let me further emphasize, there are amazing party leaders there doing great work. Um, I, I'm constantly in awe of, of, the, of the organizers, the county party leaders, the candidates that ran in those districts. What I'm suggesting is, is that it's a yes and. We hear this narrative that, oh, we have to like, focus on our suburban areas almost at the exclusion of other areas. The only reason I'm pointing this out is that we have to actually effectively look at where we are across all 95 counties and help all those counties take those next steps. So for example, those six counties that I mentioned that are on the verge of turning blue, Again, Hamilton, Knox, Rutherford, Montgomery, Madison, and Hardeman. We have to help them get to that next next benchmark. We have to help them, you know, push in, in, into turning blue so we can get Democratic candidates elected there. Um, that would have gotten Andrea Bond Johnson elected. That would have gotten Glenn Scruggs elected. There's so many candidates that that would have gotten that we would have helped get across the finish line. So what is it? So further, you know, I'm saying that having a 95 county plan means having a an urban, suburban, and rural strategy. And so I'm reading Mary's comment here. The more urban areas need to support rural communities with organizing infrastructure and volunteer elbow grease. 
I couldn't agree with you more. And they're, I mean, they're great. Uh, Davidson County, um, for example, is doing wonderful work, wonderful organizing, on the ground organizing, connecting with voters, organized almost on a precinct by precinct level. And um, so in their neighborhoods associations and reaching out in that way. We need to be you know, working and partnering with and having a mentor program that helps other county parties do that. Now, at the same point, when I'm talking to some of these county party chairs and I start to talk about precinct-based organizing, that res the immediate response is, oh my gosh, I don't even know how to think about that. I can't even get quorum at a meeting. So knowing that not every county party is in the exact same place, I want to work with all county parties to identify what are those next steps for growth over the next year. That's why that's in the 100 day the first 100 days, first thing I would do, um, because we have to be identifying that. To further Mar what Mary's suggesting and the, um, those partnerships is that, excuse me, there are 15 counties across the state that have municipal elections happening in 2021. So that means that there are 80 counties across Tennessee that are not. Um, 80 counties that should be taking next steps, 80 count, I mean, all 95 should be taking next steps, should be, you know, doing growth and identifying candidates to be running and all of all of the above. But one thing that we can be doing those 80 counties is partnering with the counties that do. And the counties that do fall in this mix of urban, suburban and rural. So again, we if we want to be growing a bench, we have to help all of those 15 counties turn out the vote for the candidates that are running in those 15 counties. So for example, Washington County going into 2021 does not have a municipal election um, happening that year, but Sullivan County right next door does in Blountville and Bristol and in Kingsport. So Washington County should partner with Sullivan County to help turn out the vote, getting volunteers, be making phone calls, text banking, canvassing, all of the above to be connecting with voters and reaching out. That is something absolutely that we can do. And partnering again, you know, having Johnson County partner in, have Unicoi County partner in, have Hawkins County partner in, and doing the same for, you know, Hancock County, for Hamilton County, all of these counties that, that have that. Um, because we can be looking and surrounding in and helping to turn out the vote. It's a great opportunity in a very um, concentrated way um, where we don't have races all across the board to build the bench. Um, reading more of Mary's comments here. Are the counties surrounding Montgomery any of the 15? Because I'm on board if so. Tell you what, Mary, I'm pulling up right beside me here. The counties that are beside Montgomery is Stewart County, um, Houston County, uh, Dixon County, Cheatham County, in Robertson County. Those are the counties that are surrounding Montgomery County. So as TNDP chair, what I would like to, what I will, will do is facilitate a process to coordinate those county parties that are um, around the counties that do. And, and I will say that, oh, and your question actually, Mary, was if Montgomery was one of the 15, I can check and get back with you. Um, I want a huge shout out to Drew Dyson with Change Tennessee, who put together a comprehensive list of all of the counties um, and all of the elected positions that have seats, come, you know, that are coming up and when they come up for election. And that's something that every county party chair should have when you come in, hey, these are the um, elections that you have to be looking at for this year and next year and so on and so forth. You know that when the trust, when the trustee is up, what school board seats are up and what is it county, is it city, what, you know, is that district two, is that district five, like what, what's happening? And so we have to, you know, county party chairs should have that straight immediately off the bat as that onboarding process um, for leadership. And so like I said, um, I'll get back to you, Mary, to find out if Montgomery is one of those 15. And um, we should be working. I'm going to suggest this also to Jordan Wilkins, though, knowing Jordan, this is absolutely on his radar. Jordan, who is the chair of the Tennessee Democrat County Chairs Association, that, um, oh, thanks. Uh, Mary for the update, the, um, that those 15 counties that do have municipal elections should be um, reached out to be asking, do we have candidates running for these municipal races? And so, um, 
So that's absolutely something that we can do already as a party. There, I mean, there's elections that are already happening and it can't wait for this chair's race to be decided. And I know all of the candidates running want to see a bench build, but I especially want to be part of the process. And I think that, and I know that this eight point plan will build a bench. And so I will, I will help in every way that I can before the 16th and after the 16th to help those counties get the resources, those counties and candidates get the resources that they need. Um, so let's see. So I know that as we've talked about um, state, why having a rural strategy matters, it's also for statewide races. We have a governor right now who has told, openly told Tennesseans that it's your fault, like straight up your fault for the mess that we're in. And that's just not true. We, I mean, we can all point to people that we know or see in a grocery store that aren't wearing a mask and say, oh, it's that individual responsibility. And yet at the end of the day, we also know leadership matters. We know that having a mask mandate matters. We know that having a leader setting an example, setting the tone matters. It matters whether or not the governor has a plan for to keep our kids safe in school. It matters that the governor does or doesn't know how to distribute the vaccine. And so we have to have, be working at, um, you know, getting a candidate elected in 2022. And the only way that we're gonna get a democratic governor elected is if we turn out the vote in all 95 counties, which means that we have to turn out the vote in our rural communities. Well, we can look at and absolutely look at that there, I mean, our biggest part of our chunk of our voting block is in Memphis. That's 100% true. We have to, you know, that is, but to further amplify the vote coming out of Memphis or the vote coming out of um, Nashville, we have to turn it out in rural communities because those three counties, those three blue counties and what, you know, one being a smaller county isn't going to carry us across the finish line. We have an eight, 802,000 vote gap to close. Um, that's what the vote gap was for our Senate race in 2020. So we have to acknowledge that every little chip away at that 802,000 matters. So if we increase the vote in Hancock County by a thousand and then increase the vote in Clay County by 200 and then we increase the vote in Ogion County by 1500 and then we increase the vote in Bradley County by 2000 and so on and so forth. We start chipping away at it and, and obviously turn out the vote in our blue areas and, and flip those six counties that I was talking about that are on the verge of turning blue, flipping those blue. All of that is how we get across the finish line to get a democratic governor. All of that is how we'll get a democratic senator in 2024. Um, we can't get across the finish line without having a strategy that includes rural er areas. So that me that also means that we can't just say, oh, we're gonna you know, go talk to rural voters or we're gonna have Facebook ads that run in rural, in rural communities. I mean, it's again, yes and. We need to be training our county party chairs um, and our, so to further train our county parties and volunteers to yes, be on Facebook, yes, run digital ads, yes, be on Twitter and Instagram, but have that complement everything that's going on on the ground. So I know that it matters so much more when a candidate comes to my door and talks to me, as I'm sure everybody here knows that it's that quality of touch that um, if a volunteer from that campaign comes and talks to me, it's an extra move, quality of touch. Um, again, getting a phone call. Um, so we have to be doing that year round, even if there isn't an election going on. So having a county party that is continually going door to door, talking to voters about what's important, talking to voters and organizing in church basements or in union halls, um, organizing in school cafeterias, having these conversations, talking about healthcare, talking about public education. We have to be talking about these issues that are affecting every rural community, every person in a rural community. And as we're going through COVID, a lot of the conversation is also around um, Medicaid expansion and access to hospitals. As more, if we see the number of ICU beds dwindling across the state, 
imagine if those 15 rural hospitals haven't closed. Um, as we've ta we're talking about whether going virtual learning or in-person learning, there is a huge gap in terms of who has access to the internet, who has access to broadband, who has access to that. We have students that are sitting in parking lots of Starbucks or in parking lots of McDonald's trying to download and do their homework because they don't have it at home. We have to be having those conversations and we have to be better equipping our students and um, and the community to handle those issues. We have to highlight that that there are rural communities that don't have access to a hospital for hours. Um, and by the time you get there, will the patient still be alive? That that's that's huge as we're going through a global pandemic. And not to forget that we have counties that are in food deserts. Um, I, I somebody. Um, actually, Carol told me from Clay County that to get a fresh baked loaf of bread, you have to drive an hour and a half. Um, that's a huge deal. Um, and that's not to say that people can't aren't baking bread at home, but when you're talking about having access to a grocery store, having access to a bakery that is doing that, um, which includes access to fresh produce, access to all of those items, that's that's a big deal. And then it gets into talking about access to nutrition, access into healthcare, um, access into job opportunities. We have a lot of industry that is leaving our areas. And as a party, we're not really talking about that a whole lot. Um, a couple years ago, the railroad left Irwin, um, closed shop and a lot of jobs. A lot of people lost jobs about that, around that. And as a party, I don't know that we saw a whole lot of messaging go out around it. Um, rural does mean agriculture, but it's not agriculture and nothing else. Um, we have to be talking about helping small farmers compete with big, big agriculture, but we also have to be talking about industry and industry that's coming in, an industry that's going to stay. That's a great way that we can be looking at, okay, um, the env environment's a big deal and we have to be protecting it. We don't have you know, too many tomorrows to go, oh, we'll, we'll put that off and we shouldn't put that off. Um, so maybe we can bring in solar panels. Maybe we can be doing more to, um, what do I say? Bring in electric, you know, make it possible for electric vehicles. And that's industry that comes in to develop that infrastructure, um, to be making the solar panels. That's jobs that can come into areas as counties and municipalities are work, you know, identifying industry to come in and par the party can be equipping uh, county parties to talk about those issues, can be equipping candidates to message around those issues, and we can be partnering with allied organizations to talk about how to reduce our carbon footprint, how to better partner to bring in these jobs, because there's a lot of parallel and crossover um, as to, okay, job opportunities are leaving, what jobs can we bring in? And we can't just say, oh, you know, there's not a whole lot of coal mining in town or in Tennessee. But I like to give this example of going, oh, coal mining's bad. And we as Democrats like to say, oh, coal mining's bad, it's bad, it's bad. And then you have people in those communities going, well, great, what do you want me to do? That's the best job that's in the area, probably the only job that's really in the area that has benefits and pays well. So do you have an alternative? Because right now that's my best bet. And to also be real, you know, at the same point, there's a point of pride that people in those communities that their fathers and their father's fathers have worked in that industry. And if we come in and say, oh, that's bad and finger wag, we're not going to get anywhere because we're not meeting people where they are. Um, so we have to show up and we have to listen. So again, I'm going into that yes and. Um, that I think a lot of rural voters feel like we as a party talk down to them. Um, oh, you know, vote against their own interests. Oh, they don't know what they're talking about. And then you get a lot of people in rural communities going, oh, those city folk just don't know what it's like out here. And every and it's shut, you know, communication shut down. There is no um, meeting. I mean, we're not talking to people. Um, we see that arguments going on all the time on social media um, or if it's happening in the community and people just don't understand. And being from the Appalachian side, of Tennessee and that whole, there is also that you, you're just not from around here, are you? 
And that's, that's a thing. And so if somebody from outside who didn't take the time to build the relationships, who didn't take the time to get to know people, to get to know what was actually going on, then that tra- the messaging is not going to have any traction. So to have a rural strategy means we have to know that. We have to know that, that culture about Appalachia, that part about, you know, that we have to not be condescending as a party, that we have to um, recognize the ingenuity and what's happening in rural communities. We have to see the struggle. We have to amplify the voices and we have to equip our county parties, our candidates and our volunteers to be able to go out into those communities and have those hard conversations. So in that we, you know, we, we talk also a lot as we talk down to people, um, which we shouldn't do as we, um, you know, in that condescending, we also downplay religion and the role of faith plays and that's and faith is a big part of a rural community um i grew up in a church here i um i personally i I will say i think faith is personal and private i but i am i'm a person of faith and i've seen growing up um in a in a church in johnson city what happens when somebody is in trouble and it's there are casseroles getting brought there are Um, people are showing up, people are, you know, what can I do? I'll take out the trash and roll it up. Can I go pick up your kid from school? Can I come and do, I'll come clean your house. I'll come do whatever you need. And there's this tight knit community. That's, I mean, in addition to being, you know, you know, when, when you go to church and what's happening and the message of the Bible, it's, or any faith-based community, but I'm, you know, focusing on, on um, Christianity, because that's a lot of what's of who's in um, rural communities, is that we we downplay that community um, that exists there, that community, that tight knit community, that is you know showing up and you know holding somebody's hand as their their loved one is dying, uh, somebody who is bringing food or organizing a meal train as somebody's coming out of the hospital. Um, that is organizing celebrations for graduations or offering a venue and a place for everybody to come together for family reunions or um, for weddings. All of these things, it's a place for community. And as a party, as we look at coalition building, as we look at building relationships with organizations, we have to be identifying communities of faith and leaders of faith. Um, and as a party, I think that we're, I mean, I do also as a person of faith believe in the separation of church and state. And I think that we talk about that to the almost exclusion of saying, yes, and yes, and come and collaborate. Yes. And let's, let's align around issues as we talk about immigration, as we talk about access to healthcare, as we talk about justice. Um, because I know around here, there are a lot of progressive churches that are lining up to talk about homelessness, that are lining up to talk about healthcare that are lining up to talk about so many issues that we all align on and we don't we don't rec- we don't come into those partnerships so i know it's um, easy to say oh that separation of church and state and ignore leaders of faith or um, to talk about that oh that you know even as a gay person that i don't feel welcome in every church but that doesn't mean that every church is bad and so knowing that, that we can't say, oh, all churches are bad. And I don't mean that all churches are bad. I mean that we haven't built relationships yet. And so that's, that should be the the key mantra is that we haven't built relationships yet, that we have to go in and do that. And um, because that's what that, you know, when we talk about faith and whether or not that separation of church and state, well, on the other side, what is, what is heard is about community. And that, oh, that community's bad. And that's not true either. Um, so let's see. I'm reading through the comments here now. I'm going to read Carol's comments. It said, yes, democratic condescension is palpable. We need to be inclusive of everyone. And we need to hold ourselves to the same standards as we do other part- do the other parties. I, I mean, obviously, I couldn't agree more, Carol. Um, and... So, um, oh, and Carol's also pointing out that both Clay County and Macon County have um, city mayoral elections in 2021. 
Um, so those are races that need candidates, races that need volunteers, campaign staff, and we can be absolutely um, working to get that done, um, to get those, turn out the vote in those areas. So I know Carol's the chair in Clay County, and so I'm, sh I'm sure that Carol's on top of it, and we can be better helping um, Carol and the other county party chairs to um, get candidates and get candidates elected and further build the bench. Um, so one thing as in a rural community or as having a rural strategy means utilizing technologies that sometimes that we've you know, looked at as technologies of the past, and that includes radio. Um, not every, again, not every area has access to broadband. Uh, a lot of people are getting news off of Facebook. That's incredibly common, whether you're rural, urban, suburban. Um, but radio is used a lot in rural communities to talk to, you know, to reach rural voters, to reach um, people to talk about issues. And so if we want to, as a party, have um, start being in that narrative, and it's an inexpensive messaging platform, is to be on radio, to be focusing on um, getting interviews on radio stations, to have um, access in through, you know, doing radio ads, doing all of it. And, and that's, I, I know I listen to NPR up here, but there's, I mean, there's a lot of stations beyond NPR as well. And I, I mean, I say this as an NPR lover, that we can be doing to reach people because it's playing in offices. It's playing in, um, as people are driving, it's playing, you know, I, I know growing up, I was helping on a farm. The radio was playing, helping on a farm. Radio was playing everywhere. And so we, we can't ignore radio as we're saying, yes, we have to have a robust digital strategy. Saying radio isn't at the exclusion of that. It, it's again, it's a yes and. Um, and meeting people where they are and rural, pe rural communities are, you know, getting information um, through radio. So I want to talk a little bit about what meaning, um, what it means for a lot of, if you're um, a county party, that's, you know, what does it mean to have a rural strategy if you're a voter and seeing a rural strat strategy? And for a candidate, what does it mean to have a rural strategy, a state party having a rural strategy? How will that affect you? What can you look to see? Um, and so for county parties, it means first and foremost, making sure that all 95 counties have a county party. Um, there are seven right now that don't, and a lot of those are in rural areas. And we have to be partnering with the Tennessee Democratic County Chairs Association to be identifying people to um, step up and organize those counties to get um, a functioning, thriving county party to happen. And we have to be training all county parties, chair party leaders on grassroots organizing. That's part of the onboarding process for um, county parties that I'd like to see and that I will implement um, after reorganizations that month after is that there are, there are virtual trainings that happen um, that you can tr tune in to learn more about fundraising strategies, how to hold a meeting, to messaging, to how to use social media, um, how to recruit candidates, how to use Vote Builder, so on and so forth. Just a constant onboarding. So if you're a county party chair, vice chair, or executive committee member, or whoever that is interested in learning how to do this, that there's going to be trainings that are posted that you can tune in and participate live. Um, but we also know that, that we need ongoing training um, so that even after that first month of intensive, here are all the training options, that you have the opportunity to log back in and do continued training. Um, I want to promote, and, I, and I've seen it before, but I also um, want to point out that Kennedy Vox also brought it up that um, the Texas Democratic Party did, is doing a great job that if you go to their website, you can immediately see the training options that are available to log in, sign up, and participate to get more experience, more training on how to do that. Um, it has been pointed out that it's not that there aren't trainings or that there haven't been trainings. They're mostly in person, and they're mostly in the Nashville area. So if you live in a community that's 
or in a county that's far away. So I, and for me to travel to Murfreesboro or to Nashville, it's a four, four and a half hour one way drive. That's more expensive um, for, you know, on gas, you know, odds are I'm probably going to stay the night. So if I'm adding a hotel, all of that's on me. Um, or if I raise the funds to have that donated or, you know, goodness knows if my county party that odds are can't afford it to pay for me just as one person to be able to go. Um, so it's more expensive if you're coming from a further out area to participate, which is why having virtual options to reach out, um, to connect with, and ongoing options to, to do that. Now I talk about why grassroots organizing is important and why that needs to be one of them. And I think that, and I said this, I believe in my last lab stream, that we we utilize social media and it is a wonderful tool. I mean, obviously I'm doing a Facebook Live right now and talking to all of you. That, um, but for the most part, I think we've all noticed this, that people don't go to social media to have a discussion. People go to social media to amplify their voice and to have people agree with them, that they like um, what was shared, that they comment that they like what was shared and that they share um, what was posted to with their friends to say, oh, look at the, you know this this amazing thing, or that I totally agree with this comment, or um, or whatever it is um, to have that. And if somebody happens to chime in in a comment section that says, hey, I'm not sure I agree with that, or can we talk about that? Because um, I have a different viewpoint, and it's usually not quite that polite when those differing opinions get posted. It becomes a, there's the line drawn in the sand and everybody's just going at it. Um, and instead, what, we've, what we know what happens with true, tried and true grassroots organizing is conversations happen. That we genuinely get to meet people where they are. That we are standing at their doorstep, you know, at their church, at their union hall, you know, wherever, at their neighborhood association meeting, and talking to people about what's going on. Talking to people about you know what's you know how to get involved but the other part i want to really point out is that we're listening is you know nobody wants anyone to come into their community come into their neighborhood come into their church or stand at their door and not listen nobody wants somebody to be told you know what's happening in their neighborhood because odds are um if somebody came if i went to any other county um, or even as chair and said, hey, I've got the solution. I know what's going on here for you. You're going to shut me out because you're like, you don't know what's going on here. You're not from here. And that's especially true in rural areas. As a chair, as a TNDP chair, I would show up and listen. That is something you can absolutely expect from me is to show up and listen, collaborate. And rural voters uh, uh, appreciate that. They appreciate that you're going to be willing to listen to, to them, to listen to what their needs are, to amplify their voices, because it's their voices that are important, not ours, not, not, not as a party leader, it's their voices that matter. And so we have to be talking about that, you know, as we're, as we're listening and they're talking about their needs, we can relate that back to a statewide platform that we have that, in, that encompasses rural needs and help them see that the Democratic Party really does represent them. Um, they, you know, we can, you know, slow walk through this process as we talk, talk to them and saying, you know, that maybe, hey, maybe you didn't know that rural broadband's, you know, our top priority, that, that we're working with the Tennessee legislature, the House and Senate caucus to get that passed. And I'm saying that in, as a sense of going as a hypothetical, like this is something that we can be doing and setting the tone for an initiative um, to move forward on. And that's, we can be talking to people, meeting people where they are, as they're telling us what's going on. Hey, I'm really having trouble. You know, my, I take my kid every night to go sit in the McDonald's parking lot because we're on virtual learning and it's really a struggle. I can't hardly get dinner made. They're eating fast food all the time and I don't have the money to even, you know, afford fast food all the time because um, I'm not able to be home enough to cook dinner. Um, so a hypoth this is something that I've heard from a voter in Washington County real real true story and so um or yeah even as denise points out that the um internet access um just keeps cutting out even as you're trying to watch this live stream that 
um, that that's, that's an issue if you're trying to watch your teacher give a lecture or be tuned in for a Zoom meeting with colleagues. And so as this voter, is, if you're, as you're standing on this doorstep with this voter and talking to them about, hey, this is, they're telling you this is the struggle that they're having, that this is something that is hurting them and being able to move forward in their career or to be able to start their small business or to be able to help their kids get a better education because they're having trouble with access. We can be talking about, hey, um, the Democratic Party is here for you um, and talk about our platform and what the initiatives we're having and how we can help get, the, um, get them connected, help solve these problems. Because rural voters, same as a suburban voter, same as an urban voter, um, wants to know that we're going to work to fix the problem and that we have a plan for that and we're fighting for that plan. We're working towards solutions within that plan. And, um, and so as we're, you know, we have to be showing up and, and having those conversations and saying, yes, the Democratic Party is here for you. Um, they just might not know it yet. And I don't mean that in a, you know, we don't know something until we know something. I might not know my neighbor supports me as being a gay person until I have that conversation with them um, to find out that they do. And I can make all kinds of assumptions about the neighbor across the street until I have that conversation with them. And so um, I'm reading another comment from somebody who's saying that so many students cannot complete assignments during virtual learning, that their stepmom um, says it's a nightmare in Greene County, that that's, I mean, that's students' access to being able to, um, you know, this is being able to access their assignments, complete their assignments, that, you know, we talk about rural broadband, that's, this is what we're talking about as it's rolling out, as it's, um, you know, solving these problems, these, these connectivity issues. And I don't think that we have to compromise our values to, um, to move forward or to talk about rural issues. Um, again, I don't think it, you know, compromises that I want to be accepted as a gay person in my community, as a masculine presenting gay person in my community, I'm still going to live absolutely 100% authentically. And I'm going to continue to have the hard conversations around, you know, what does that mean to, um, you know, to be a gay woman in a conservative society or in a certain conservative community. And I think that the same thing that we see as when anybody lives authentically that, and more people come forward is like, this is who I am. It dispels any uh, assumptions about who people are um, that we're, you know, that we're just like everybody else. And so I think that we have, there's a lot of narrative around that in rural communities, we have to go towards conservative Democrats or middle of the road Democrats. And one, I am 100% a, belie a believer in that people, candidates have to be authentic and run authentically with what they believe, because if you're not authentic, that comes across in everything that you do. Um, so it's important to know that to be authentic. Um, and I think it's also important to, especially if somebody disagrees with you on an issue, to learn how to have the hard conversation that go that isn't just a show up and you're like, saying, oh, you're wrong and I'm right. Um, even if inside we think that, it's having the conversation of, you know, I want you to hear me, and but I want to hear you. I want to listen. And so, because more often than not, um, when somebody feels heard, they're going to listen to you. And I know we get tripped up a lot of around abortion. We get pigeonholed around abortion. And I am a pro-choice Democrat 100% of the way. And I think that we have to be able to have the hard conversations that when somebody comes and says, well, you know, I, I hear you on all these issues. I don't want rural hospitals to close. I don't want this to happen. But man, I just can't get behind abortion. I think when we start talking about in the I statements of, well, I, my, my beliefs and my values are this. I believe in that we should be, you know, it's a private medical decision. That's, that's my value. Start having this, you know, or not, and, and encourage them to talk to talk to you about, well, tell me how you got here. You know, what's going on? Why, why do you believe what you do? I want to, you know, like have that genuine, I want to know. 
Um, because if you can find what, I mean, why people are at the heart of why they think what they think, then we can start to connect on what's going on. Um, how can we move forward? How can we, you know, move forward on issues? How can we get women and um, an, an increase reproductive um, access of, for reproductive choice and reproductive justice? How can we move forward on those issues? And I do believe it means having the tough conversations and, and they are hard. I don't, I'm not here to tell you that it's easy and that it's going to be a simple solution or shouting from one street corner to another. Though I'm going to also say thank you to every person that stands in front of a clinic and keeps people safe as they go and enter that clinic to receive any type of medical care if that clinic provides abortions because that's that is huge and I know that people give um, endlessly to make sure that patients are safe. Um, but those conversations that are happening in churches, those conversations that are happening in grocery stores, on front porch stoops, or you know at six feet away during the pandemic, that we have to be having those one-on-one -on -one hard conversations about, well, how did we get here? And you know what's at the heart, what's at the root of why we're feeling and thinking the way we are about something? Because we have to know that about ourselves as to, you know, how did we get here? Why, you know, why am I a pro-choice Democrat? What does that mean? So I can more effectively talk about that with, um, you know, with somebody else about what does that mean for them if they're saying, well, I, you know, I just have a hard time with, you know, with that decision is why I vote the way I do. And we can start to relate to what does that mean? Does that mean, okay, well, you know, I, I hear you of what you're saying. Does that mean that, you know, if you're all about supporting the, the fetus, then let's start talking about, you know, also the, the values that go just beyond those nine months um, and start pulling them in to that. And if you slow walk them into that, hey, it goes beyond that nine months, you can probably also start to slow walk that back. Um, there's, it is a contentious issue and we don't win anything by facts. Um, it is a, it's an emotional issue for so many people. Um, but I do think that I'll say, I will say with the exception of, I think that the one fact that I, I think is surprising for a lot of people that are on the other side of the issue is to say that when we have Democrats in office, when we have a democratic president, the number of abortions go down. And I don't think a lot of people know that. Um, and so we can be having um, those conversations around, you know, what does that mean if you, you know, if somebody actually wants to decrease abortions, like elect a Democrat. Um, and this is also an opportunity for partnering with our allied organizations. Um, Denise, um, who's also commenting on, in the comment section, I, you know, shout out to her who also posted that there was a training uh, done by NARAL about how to have co these conversations in uh, challenging spaces. And I tuned into that this past week. Um, it was an hour and a half training session. And I know Planned Parenthood does this and you know other organizations to be having these conversations so that we're better equipped when we do canvas, when we do go door to door, that when we're out talking about healthcare or job opportunities or something and this voter goes, oh, Democrats, I can't vote for you. You're out here to take my guns and kill babies. How do you have a conversation with somebody that says that? And odd, you know, and so many Democrats do have guns at home, and so many Democrats do have that. And um, and so we have to have a way to have a conversation. Um, especially, I mean, especially, let me emphasize: if you're standing on somebody's doorstep, make sure you are you feel safe. Um, but that you know, equipping people, so training. Um, county party leaders, and I've focused a lot on this, but county party leaders around how to have these grassroots organizations, and especially around these challenging conversations, will help further issues, will help get Democrats elected to office, will help the county party grow. Um, because it's hard to demonize somebody that you've gotten to know. Um, once we, you know, get to know somebody, it's like, you know, like, oh, that person is just, that's not a bad person. And that, you know, that canvasser that we're going to see in the grocery store, like, oh, you know, I saw Kate, you know, Kate was talking to me the other day. Or um, I'm going to use Jody Jones, who's one of our county commissioners and, you know, elected Democratic uh, members. And, you know, she's doing great work for our county and, you know, does great service to our community. And it dispels this notion of what a Democrat looks like. Who is a Tennessee Democrat? 
So again, talking about, you know, what, what could this a rural strategy look like for county parties? And again, that also means having resources that county party leaders can log into so that they can, you know, maybe not everybody has a graphics person. There's some ready-made graphics that are ready and available, um, helping with fundraising, all of that stuff to get um, everybody up and running. And um, so for voters, this also means having a statewide platform. What, you know, that as a rural person, see rural voters seeing my needs reflected up on the party platform in addition to you know if you live in a suburban community in addition to if you live in an urban community and then there's universal things on a platform regardless of where you live that on the platform um but that we're seeing that those needs reflected and even as a priority those needs being reflected so um i want to add that um denise added said yes we know how to do this obama did it um, but it is all, um, always only the pregnant person's choice whether to terminate a pregnancy or not. Yes, 100% agree with you, Denise. 100% agree with you. Um, and so, let's see. Um, and the, um, oh, and that the party helps. I'm, I have notes over here. Um, and for a voter, that, um, you know, as we're speaking to what people need and what, um, you know, what's going on, that the party identifies, what does it mean to be a Tennessee Democrat? Um, I think that if all of us were to step back and go, you know, what does that mean? Um, all of us would have a different answer of what does a Tennessee Democrat look like? And, and yeah, and or might not even be able to answer that. Um, though I'm going to probably make a wild guess that Dolly's right up there for a lot of us. Um, but that, you know, who, who is a ten Tennessee Democrat? Who, I, who embodies the values of a Tennessee Democrat? And be able to, you know, look at that, dispel that notion of, you know, we're not the, you know, again, the national narrative is that demonizing scary, we're out rioting in the streets, um, and that, that's not going to, I mean, we, we're not, that's not who we are, um, but that's the national narrative. Um, and having a rural strategy for candidates meaning that there's training available um, that includes are you running in a rural area, suburban area, urban area, and, and knowing that those district lines aren't 100% restrictive to is that an urban area, suburban area, or rural area. Um, Glenn Scruggs' district went from an urban area into a rural area. And so there needs to be a rural strategy to help candidates like Glenn Scruggs. Um, and that we have to have a transparent system of support for our candidates that includes offering a baseline level of support for, um, for all candidates to help be pushing the, driving the needle, to help be turning out the vote, which further helps all up and you know, down ballot and up, up the ticket um, candidates, statewide, statewide races in, in that, and equipping county parties to be part of a, count, uh, camp, a coordinated campaign so that we can be turning out the vote, talking about, you know, driving out messaging, joint mailers to, um, you know, digital ads to getting, but most importantly, getting volunteers for all of the, the, the candidates that are on the ticket um, that whether they're um, running for school board or running for U.S. Senate, that we have to have volunteers out doing that. And and this applies to also to so many across the um, the board that when we have people, uh, county party leaders that step up uh, in, in red rural areas or um, candidates that step up in red rural areas, we have to have for, you know, as a party resources and training and um, around this to help to help those people identify how to have a community while speaking out on issues in a red rural area, and, and especially in small towns. Um, the, that the, right, I, th I think a lot of people, this has been a lot of conversation that, you know, comments that I've heard, that a lot of people feel hung out to dry, that they feel isolated. And so we lose candidates, we lose county party leaders because they're tired of being on the front lines and attacked and feeling like they don't have a community where they live, where they go to church, where they go grocery shop, where they work. And um, it becomes incredibly isolating. So we have to have conversations and narratives around that if, as we're going to continue to build the pipeline, as we're going to continue to bring people in, and as we're going to, you know, pipeline for candidates, pipeline for party leaders. 
and make, you know, develop, help develop a community and have conversations around what does it mean to have a community um, as you are speaking out. Uh, let's see here. Jeff added, um, you must speak directly to working families. Our other initiatives will gain traction if that demographic is, ac is accessed. Absolutely. Absolutely. This goes into everything from we can't be speaking down to, to talking to the needs of what these families, what these households are experiencing. Um, I don't think we talk a lot as a party about what does it mean to be an Alice household. Um, the easiest way I know how to describe that is that um, is Alice is an acronym for Asset Limited Income Constrained Employed. So it's a very fancy way of saying the working poor. And in Johnson City, that's just shy of 55% of the households in Johnson City are Alice families, can't afford a $400 emergency. And these statistics are all pre-COVID. Um, so if a tire goes out, if um, window breaks, tree falls through the roof, um, medical emergency, or you know, fall and break a leg to car wreck to whatever, car breaks down, um, what is that family going to do? And so what is that household going to do? What is that person going to do? How are, how are they going to handle that? We don't talk a lot as a party collectively about that issue and um, making things, you know, making a system that works for people. Um, so Jeff, you are absolutely right that we have to be amplifying the voices of working families, not talking to or talking at, or I mean, we should be talking with, People, but not talking at working families, amplifying working families' voices. Um, so yeah, I want to, you know, we're, we're pushing the hour mark, and I hopefully have gotten to everybody's comments or questions as well. Um, and so the um, thank you for tuning in, and I want to encourage everyone to be sure to reach out to your TNDP executive committee member and um, ask them, you know, tell them that you want to sign up to get involved in the 2021 races, that you want to sign up to get involved to flip seats um, coming in 2022 as well, that you want to get involved in your county party, that you want to get involved at the state level with, you know, what are some initiatives, whether that's, you know, the Rural Caucus, the Black Caucus, the Veterans Caucus, and so on and so forth, um, or you see a need for a caucus to be formed that's not there, and you want to help get that started. Whatever that is, for you that you want to get involved in, please contact your TNDP executive committee member and um, and and reach out and say that you know you're here to get signed up. You want to get involved and tell them that Kate sent you. And you know as you're you know as you're talking to them, tell them that you you saw this live stream and that you want to see a rural strategy implemented. You want to um, have that, um, so that we can move forward on issues that we can get Democrats elected and we can grow our democratic party together. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you everyone for tuning in. I'll get the link posted in the comment section for the TNDP executive committee, um, for everybody to, uh, be able to find, oh, here it is. Thank you, Jordan. Um, so you can find that there is per state law, one man, one woman for every st state Senate district. Um, so find your Senate district in there and contact those two members of the county of your uh, TDP executive committee member. And, um, and just to kind of preemptively say that that is, that is something I would like to see us have a more inclusive language for how our executive committee is formed. Um, so that's, that is, um, you know, saying that as one man, one woman, I recognize the problems within that non-inclusive statement, um, but it is state law currently. Um, but yes, thank you for tuning in. Um, I know that all of you all are either curious about uh, rural strategy, why it's important, actively working in rural communities and want to know, know how I would work as a chair to bring um, change in rural communities, to grow efforts in rural communities, to amplify voices in rural communities. And so please feel free to reach out to me at any point. Um, and I'm always available to answer questions to help um, get that going. And I think the only thing that I didn't add is that, you know, one of the big changes that I would do is I would hire a director of rural affairs to work with the TNDP Rural Caucus. So I didn't, I mean, we'll just say I saved the best for last. Um, it is definitely not a last priority, but we have to have a rural focus. Um, Tennessee is majority rural. And if we, if we don't have that, that focus, we're not going to get a democratic governor or a democratic senator. 
So thank you everyone. Um, happy holidays and I will see you all at the next live stream. So thank you and have a great afternoon.